We're here today talking to Ardi Kola, who's the author of a new report on global opportunities for sports consultancy businesses uh, up to the year 2022. So, Ardi, please tell us a little bit about the report. Well, the report, as far as we're aware, is the first of its kind ever published because what it did do was it looked at 55 single one-off sports events, global events, which are taking place across the world over the next 10 years. And it identified where the incremental business is for sports marketing consultancy services right across the sector. And, it, and the opportunities are massive because we've calculated there are about $9 billion worth of incremental new business over the next 10 years. So it's a terrific opportunity for anyone within our sector to get a handle as to where those new opportunities are and what they need to do in order to, to land them, to, to, to secure them for their business. And the, the nine billion dollar figure that you mentioned, how, how did you come to that figure? What, what sort of things does it include? Well, it's quite a large number, but actually the actual overall number is even bigger. What we tried to do was to understand what was the investment made by governments, they tend to be governments, in putting on massive events like a World Cup or Olympic Games, for example. As you can imagine, there's a huge amount of economic activity. As a percentage of that economic activity in that country, what could be identified for sports marketing and consultancy services, where that's providing products and services to the government, products and services to the construction industry, for example, products and services to brands who want to sponsor those events, and the whole infrastructure, transportation, logistics, and even finance and media rights that really wrap around those huge events. So what we've done through a group of researchers was to identify what those opportunities are and to quantify them in a financial way. A lot of people would assume that China, for example, would be the, the biggest uh, region for opportunity for these sort of companies, but in fact the report didn't find that. Can you, can you tell us which countries and regions did hold the greatest opportunity? Well, the report goes into some detail in terms of which regions perhaps hold the best opportunities for incremental new business, but I can, without giving the whole report away, clearly Qatar and Russia and even France itself have a huge amount of opportunity for incremental new business for not just the number of events that are happening on those territories, but the value that the governments are investing in putting those events on. And so it's not just about numerically the number of events that are taking place within a territory, but how much is being invested in those events. And as we come up to the Winter Olympics and past the Winter Olympics, Rio in Brazil, there's a huge amount still ongoing in terms of investment in those huge events. And in terms of getting that business, how, how should companies approach the countries and the people who are awarding the contract? What sort of lead times, what sort of cultural issues do they have to address to get business there? Well, that's an area which the report does cover. I mean, if you're watching this interview and you're thinking of getting on a plane and going to Russia or Rio, I would probably save your money because you're probably too late. But that doesn't mean there are not enough opportunities for you to look at and to go for the next 10 years. There's plenty of them. One of the things that came out of the research that we did was that collaboration is absolutely key. In fact, it's essential if you're looking at doing business in a market that you're not in. So if you're in the UK or Europe and you're looking to do business in the East, it's very important that not just going there on a, on a business trip organised by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, but actually having a relationship with businesses and organisations on the ground that's going to make a massive difference for you. Because Governments award contracts in those markets in a very different way to how you would perhaps bid for work otherwise. And a lot of the time, they're under some pressure to award contracts locally. And that's fair. What you want to be, if you're interested in markets which you're not in, is to partner with those local organisations, to collaborate with them, and to provide them with goods and services that perhaps they don't have, or expertise and experience that they're looking to get, but they don't have locally. So essentially what you seem to be saying is that in order to, in order to bid and indeed win this, this work, it, it's a fairly long-term investment. Is it also 
a costly investment in terms of in terms of actual finance to get the work. There are two schools of thought regarding whether it's costly or not. It really depends on what your business is. If you're an architectural firm, then clearly the value of those contracts that you're bidding for can be quite substantial, in which case your marketing and your sales budget needs to reflect what those opportunities look like. Part of your marketing and sales budget, we suggest in this report, needs to be earmarked for travel, for entertainment, for hospitality, for research. And those things are quite important. If you're not really looking to get an awful lot of your business through export, if you like, then you need to think which opportunities are you really interested in? Which areas do you really feel you have a specialism and you can offer something to the local markets which they don't currently have? And just focus on trying to secure those contracts. So there's a huge amount of opportunity, but what one has to do, Simon, is to calibrate those and to sift those through in a way which makes commercial sense for you as a business. And so far from your experience, which, which countries, companies have been most successful in, in going for this business internationally? Is it the UK, is it Germany, USA? Is it their agencies and architects and infrastructure companies that have been most successful? Well, the good news is you don't have to be a, a worldwide network to get global business. Those days, they may have existed, but they're not. They've gone to some extent. Size does matter depending on what you're bidding for. What's really important are relationships. What's come through the research is having relationships locally, not just simply going on a trade mission, but having a constant dialogue with the people in that market. Where you've got sports governing bodies that are bidding to host games, host events, it's absolutely useful if you support them in that because if they should win the rights to hosting those games, you're in a very good position then to pick up further work. So helping cities and governments bid for events is a really great business development opportunity. It may not make a lot of money in the short term, but long term it may open the door to much bigger contracts for you. So it, it is a long-term investment to try and win the business, really. It's, it's starting relationships at a, at a very basic level and, and developing them, putting in some effort, and, and hope that they'll win the bids that they're, they're bidding for. Well, the whole process of business development is quite an interesting one. What one needs to do to start with is actually to get something like this and actually read it cover to cover. Because only then can you get a sense as to which opportunities are relevant for you. Not all the opportunities in this report are going to be relevant for everyone that reads it. But there will be some, more than likely, one or two, possibly more, that you are really absolutely in the pole position to make an effective bid for. So what this report does is to navigate your thinking around what those opportunities look like, What's the value of those opportunities for you? Whether you're infrastructure, technology, media, whether you're in your sports rights, sponsorship support, whether you're um, able to design a building or um, look at logistics and transportation. There's a whole myriad of things that one has to think about doing in terms of these events. And you might have expertise experience which is so good that you can bid for that particular piece of work. But it's about having those relationships in place, finding out who's in the market, and trying to partner with them. I really do think that if you think you can go into a market you're not in and win business, it, 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 I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's extraordinarily difficult. And there are not that many case studies that demonstrate that you can. So having partnerships locally is absolutely key. But identifying those opportunities at the beginning of your journey is what you really need to do. A lot of people make, make, make mistakes by thinking, they'll go on a trade mission and they'll see whether people need some stands, they need some seats. And actually, the contract to supply those seats and stands has already happened. And so you've wasted your time. You have to qualify in what those opportunities look like. And then just focus on a few. You mentioned 55 events are happening up to 2022. Uh, most people think of things like the World Cups and Olympics as one-off events, but um, th there's quite a lot of investment in relatively, what we would perceive as relatively small events in Paris, isn't there? 
Well, there is. I mean, what we didn't do was to factor in the opportunities which, frankly, have already gone with respect to Premier League football, with respect to Formula One, for example. We had to factor those in because the report was written primarily to give a sense to businesses of what incremental new business is out there that you can win. And a lot of those contracts that we have identified, which, are in this, which is in this report, are available. They're not things that are notional or So they're not ongoing, academic. They're not no. ongoing events in any respect. They're so all one-off. Th th they are one-off events where there is a need to bring in resources, expertise, experience in order to deliver those events. Now, as you've rightly indicated, it's not just about the World Cup and the Olympic Games. There's a whole range of other, other activities which businesses can get themselves involved with. Interestingly, if you're a brand and you're interested in the Chinese market, for example, then there's an awful lot of properties that one could get involved with and events that, that, that one could get involved with with respect to table tennis. If you're interested in the United States, and in particular uh, reaching diverse audiences, then there's a property called the Gay Games, which is phenomenally successful, really, really well managed, incredibly well run, with huge amount of investment and interest in it. And those are kind of two examples, if you like, which perhaps you may not have considered, but those and other examples are in the report, which gives you a sense that it's not just the Olympics, it's not just football, where the opportunities are globally over the next 10 years. Generally speaking, you've talked about a lot of regions and a lot of markets here. Are those markets open to outsiders on the whole, even, even if it requires coming in with, uh, with a joint venture partner, is there an acceptance for, for outside companies? That's a really good question. Um, what you have to avoid doing is telling them how to do it. One of the things that came across from the research we did for this report was that there's a lot of what we call knowledge transfer, that local teams, local businesses, local organisations, local governing bodies want. They want to learn how to do things at an international standard, whether that be hospitality, logistics, um, organising the event. And they're very keen to learn how to do that from a global perspective because sometimes a lot of these nations haven't had the experience of putting on massive global events. So they're very open to that, but what they don't want to do is be told how to do it. So what they want to do is learn how to do it and there is a subtle difference so if you can as much as you can work with local partners and as i said knowledge transfer your expertise and experience to that local market you're going to be more successful and you probably get more business as a result okay finally um apart from obviously encouraging people to buy a copy of the report if there was one one piece of advice you had to give to people looking to get business in these markets, what would it be? The one piece of advice I would give anyone is to do their homework. I can't, I can't overemphasize how important doing your homework is before you start spending money. And I think you've got to really consider very carefully what your own business plan is. Where do you see the opportunities for growth for your business? Where do you want to take your organisation? A lot of organisations I spoke to are going to grow their business as a result of a lot of the research that we did for this report. But that's their vision. That's their purpose. Is that the same as yours? Do you want to grow your business to be more international? If you do, then I think an investment like this, which isn't massively expensive, is actually a good first start. Having got to that point, you then need to identify what those opportunities are and to really focus on who are the best relationships for you in those markets. And then, as we have discussed through this interview, think about forming relationships, think about collaboration, think about knowledge transfer being really important to most of the people that you'll get to meet. And think about how logistically you can, you can deliver your products and service into that market. And I think you're likely to succeed in the next 10 years. Adi Kola, thank you.